Greetings everyone, my name is Professor Les Henry and welcome to the Outer View where reason comes first. It is an honour today to bring my old buddy, Casper Melville. Brother Casper, Dr. Casper Melville, how are you doing? I'm well thanks Les, thanks for having me. Oh, no problem, no problem. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm, I t I'm a lecturer at SOAS, University of London, where I convene an MA in uh, global creative and cultural industries. Mm. I used to be a music journalist. My main sort of preoccupations, I write a lot about music, culture, race it, kind of issues. Uh, yeah, so um, I, currently I'm locked down doing my yeah, stuff online, as, like most of us. Yeah, as we all are. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, and we've known each other since the 90s when we were at goldsmiths as students or whatever and i know one of the things that we've always reasoned about over the years is you know why why do you think white people don't do more in the context of racism and, and to, to kind of frame it and i'm talking about the people who we know perhaps can do better why yeah I, I this is something that's really preoccupied me recently you know what with this strange conjuncture we're in with COVID and then Black Lives Matter happening at the same time. And all of this talk about, you know, a lot of white people saying, oh, give me a reading list and, you know, tell me about it and kind yeah. of seeing, seeming to expect black people to explain racism to them all over yeah. again. And yeah. my question is like, well, why don't they know that already? You know, I mean, it's great to see René Ideologi's book on the top of the bestseller list, right? Fantastic. On the one, it's, it's, that's great. But, you know, that book's a kind of primer. Right? It's kind of a basic thing. I would hope every 16 year old would read that book. Mm. But people who are, let's say, 30 plus or 40 or whatever, it's like they should know that stuff already. They really should. And I just don't understand. And I've been trying to think through why it is that people seem so ignorant about it. Um, what are the sort of processes which have led to this ignorance? And why don't they consider that this issue is their issue as well? You yeah. know, it's, it's not a matter of saying, I mean, obviously, there are specific experiences that black people have of racism which white people don't always get access to. I know, for example, many of my black friends, you know, they don't always discuss the details of what they've experienced with their white people who haven't experienced it themselves for whatever reason or because it's, you know, it's a sort of kind of knowledge which is traumatic or which is not a shared experience. Or sometimes I think they just don't want to sort of dwell on it too much because they're yeah. busy, you know, making their lives. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Be crushed down by it. But still, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. I mean, you don't have to read Bell Hooks, Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, although you should, but you could be reading Gary Young in the paper. You can be, you Absolutely. could see Stuart Hall Absolutely. on the TV. You could just listen to some black music, listen to Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye or Kendrick Lamar or Stormzy, and you're going to learn about racism alongside lots of other things. So I think there's a, an element of willful ignorance here, not yeah. wanting to think about it because it's, there's obviously not, if you're a beneficiary of a system, there's less, sort of urgency to change it and yeah. i think a lot of people can hide behind what the discourse which has happened over the last few years you know political correctness gone mad victim culture you know yeah. um identity politics you know people complaining about stuff or sometimes people think reach for post-racism you know oh but we're beyond that now that's all yeah. over that's history yeah. but not not to recognize and understand how racism fundamentally structures our world not just the lives of black people but everybody's lives yeah all the systems that surround us is a level of stupidity or, or ignorance which is you know unacceptable i mean yeah. and when you see someone like dominic Raab, i mean it was yesterday right dominic Raab. In, i mean either he's making a joke which is pathetic or he literally thinks that bending and taking the knee is something to do with Game of Thrones and yeah. not to do with Martin Luther King and the whole tradition of all the way up to Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. And I think that at the root of it, actually, in the, in the British, in, I think it's important, it's great to be you know, identifying with, empathising with police uh, issues around police brutality in America and George Floyd. I mean, that's an important moment of building empathy. But I think we should try and look outside the American definitions of race and think about what's happening in the UK very specifically. Yeah. And in the UK, the issue is class as much as it is race. I mean, we learn from cultural studies, you know, race is the modality in which class is lived. So there are obviously specific issues. But when it comes, class is still the structuring uh, sort of model for everything. Look at the upper reaches of, well, look at our cabinet, look at the BBC, look at finance, look at the judiciary. And I think that, I mean, if I wanted to be purposive about this and make some sort of suggestion, it might seem a bit odd and a bit kind of 
off topic, but I think the fundamental issue that we should be addressing in the UK is to do with the way the class system continues to distort our world. It's to do with the connection to empire, colonialism, post-colonial melancholia, as Paul Gilroy says. So mm -hmm. my recommendation, if we wanted to change the situation, would be abolish private schooling. Because I think okay. it's tough. Right, so there's a couple of things I wanted to, I wanted to reason with you through, because yeah. as I said, for me, this is about reasoning. And I love you know, the nuances of what you were just suggesting. But for me, there are a couple of striking things in there. The class thing I get, because people who have heard me speak over the years, I always say this is an inherently racist, classist, and sexist society. Now let's begin a conversation. Because yeah. these things are complexly interwoven in that because my parents and their generations were firmly lumped into the working classes. However, we were one rung below the white working classes. So that's where that racial, so when people are talking about intersectionality and stuff like that, that's maybe part of how those tendrils weave around us and our narrative. But Absolutely. for me, yeah. one, of, one of the things I wanted to kind of, you know, maybe we tease that aspect out is when I speak, I always speak about why is it that peoples of African ancestry are encouraged to be historically amnesic. Now, that also happens to a lot of the white population, but I think it's different. I think with the white population, they are educated to be historically amnesic, i.e. with those, those stories, accounts, counter histories, an aspect of, of Prof. Paul Gilroy's melancholia. They are not taught that, so they don't know. They're oblivious to it. Whereas for a lot of black people, we have to find those alternate histories. Again, when, when, when Paul Gilroy speaks about you know, the double consciousness in, in modernity. Yeah, know, there's, that, the there's that doubling, Du Bois, I should say, which Paul Gilroy um, developed when he spoke about modernity and double consciousness. Yeah. You know, the, the drivers for modernity, the hidden aspect. But my point is this. The other day, I did a, I did a talk, and I pointed out to people how racist Boris Johnson is. I've worked with him. I worked with him in 2012. But he was the politician. So, for instance, this would have probably been when we were at Goldsmiths, because I was at, this was at 2002 when I was at Goldsmiths, and I was teaching. And I remember I used to use some of Boris Johnson's opinions on Africa and African people. The stuff that has been resurfacing lately about, you know, the Queen is happy with the Commonwealth because it gives her a chance to get greeted by smiling, flag-waving pickaninnies, and the fact that he said, we should re-scramble Africa. And you know, one of the things about Africa is that we felt guilt about it. Next time we shouldn't feel guilty, paraphrasing it. So to me, as a, as a black person, as a person of African ancestry, I remember that stuff. Mm. And when I bring it up to people, they're like, oh, well, you know, forgive, give them a chance. Why is that? Because <laughs> I think that, you know, the point that you, again, that you make about, um, the point that you made about everybody clamoring for these books. You know, I've had people asking me, can I furnish them with reading lists and stuff like that? Which is why I, I tweeted the other day. I was the first black academic in the UK to write a book on whiteness. And I'm, I'm not the first black academic who tried, but when I got rejected from these publishers, I do what Les does and I put it out. Yeah. And that for me is the, is the qualitative difference because I can bet you there are black scholars who wanted to put books out on whiteness before 2007, but didn't. So to me, it's this whole notion of, of you know, whose accounts do we go by? Whose narrative is important? And who is, who is the most important person to speak to that history? I think what you say, you know, it picks up so many interesting things. There is, a, there is an experiential difference. Talking about the double consciousness, and I was always struck, I can't remember whose who's, um, quote it is, I think it might be Malcolm X, it's like, um, what does it feel like to be a problem? You know, the idea that you have to Probably grow with up. Du Bois. That, with Du Bois again, okay. Bois so again, it's yeah. about the idea of being, of having to view yourself in this double way because you're viewing yourself, I mean, Fanon obviously does it with the, uh, look, Mama Negro uh, yeah, yeah. scene in the book. It's like having to think of yourself from outside yourself as the way other people think of you. Yeah. The, the beauty of whiteness, let's put it like that, is that it doesn't force you to do that. It allows your in, you individuality. I mean, Richard Dyer's book on whiteness, 
uh, you know, A White Academic Book on Whiteness is a good book as well. And, and he says that whiteness confers the right to individuality, which is denied yeah. those people who have to see themselves as part of some sort of block. Which um, in some ways mirrors what I believe it was um, Maya Angelou or Toni Morrison, one of them, head's not good at the moment, but one of them said white people are the only racial group without an ethnicity. It, that's right. You know, and we don't, we, I'm going to speak now on behalf of white people. We don't have an... No, don't speak on behalf of white people. <laughs> speak on behalf no. of Casper. Oh, I'll speak, speak on behalf of myself. That I do know. not have a, an immediate experience of myself as white. I was never told I was white. I was never encouraged to imagine that I was white or to think about whiteness as being something that was part of me. I was, and I was a, an individual. And this is why a lot of white people get very nervous when you start calling them white, actually, because they... They don't really want that. They want to have the benefits of being white without actually having to think about what that means. And it's important for us to raise that up a little bit. Yeah. For me, I have been influenced strongly by Albert Memmi and Franz Fanon to understand that the thing about racism is that it's bad for everyone. You know, actually, it's corrosive on the soul of the colonizer. It is, yeah. it is a poison inside you, just like toxic masculinity is a poison, is a trap, it's yeah. a prison. And that's where I think we can find the grounds of some solidarity to work together. So to this issue of like, what's the role of white people in the struggle for black liberation? Yeah, yeah. It's the struggle for everyone's liberation. This is what the Combahee, uh, you know, River Collective talked about, you know, thinking specifically about black women's liberation. If you liberate black women, you liberate everyone. That's what they say. Yeah. You know, including those of us who might appear to be beneficiaries, you know, I think yeah. this idea of sort of um, white privilege, I think we could do with thinking about that a bit more carefully. My, my good friend Patrick Turner wrote a piece recently. It's not been published, but it's really influenced me on this. And he says he, he's not convinced that white privilege is the right way to put it in the sense that what we're talking about are not privileges. Like the right to walk down the street unmolested by the police or to be not to be judged to be who, a certain kind of person because of the color of your skin is not a privilege. It's a right. It's yeah. a right which I have and it's deprived to other people. And that can give you grounds for solidarity, for building a solidarity around the idea that everybody should have access to these basic rights. Yeah. Because the problem with the, the idea of privilege, it gets very complicated, especially when you're trying to talk to people who are not obviously privileged in Absolutely. many ways. Absolutely. Um, and, and they're not gonna go for that argument. But if you say, look, there's someone over there who's not being given access to the same rights that you take for granted, that everyone should take for granted, yeah. that gives us somewhere to go, I yeah. think. And I Absolutely. Also... And, and sorry, even on that point, because one of the reasons I did the other day with um, um, Dr. Gabby Beckles Raymond, she said exactly the same thing, you know, because sometimes it's about benefits and how you how you benefit from being white. Yeah. But not necessarily that all white people are in equal positions of privilege, which is often used to undermine the argument. So that's right. Yeah, for that's me, right. that is that is a crucial point. But there and are I've benefits. Yeah. I've experienced this very directly, right? My experience of being in America, right? I was in America for through most of the 90s, right? I experienced a racialization of a kind in America. And I, but I, what I experienced was the huge benefits of being a white British person in America. Those, I was, it was assumed that I was clever, I was honest, that I was related to the Queen if I told people I was, which I did yeah. at one point, just to see what happened. And, you know, so... I got the huge benefit of this assumption. And you know what? It wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for me as a person because whenever you are assumed to be something which is not you inside, it's, not, it's bad for you. And, yeah. and it opens up all kinds of opportunities for you to be sort of estranged from your true self. Yeah. You know, the temptation was to, you know, go and take piss and kind of, you know, exploit people really, but knowing that they didn't really know who I was because they couldn't see beyond the fact that I had yeah. this accent which reminded them of Sherlock Holmes and yeah. grey poupon mustard, you know what I'm saying? I know yeah. that's a trivial yeah. example in a way, but it's... But it's not, that's because what it's, it's profound, because that's where their knowledge comes from. We have got re historical resources in London for the founding of a strong, multicultural sol sense of solidarity and the idea of building a new world. We have these resources that Absolutely. happened in Rock Absolutely. Against Racism, in club culture, in sound system culture, organically in the streets. Yeah. And we need to recover those histories and we need to, we need to honour them because though we do, we, we've both read Paul Gilroy, right? We know and, and we aspire to a, a world beyond race. We do. We want to build it. And, and black politics, I think, is, is leading, wants to lead to that direction. 
but only once the true scale of white supremacy has been reckoned with and been unpicked. And yeah. that's where we want to head. And we do have some of the resources for that. And that's where we need to recover those. We need to, I mean, I wrote my book recently, which is precisely about trying to recover that history of a, of a multiculture, which was offering new opportunities and new possibilities yeah. to the world, which is yeah. too easily overlooked, gets commodified, becomes... Yeah, and, it, and it becomes a vulgar representation. You know, it's mixing fish and chips with, I don't know, ackee and saltfish or something. It becomes the Benetton the, the, version the of stupid absolutely, yeah. corporate multiculturalism, as Paul Yeah, it. absolutely. You've absolutely. got to be light on your feet to try and avoid that. There's very interesting debates going on at the moment in like the drum and bass community, for example, I don't know if you've been following this, where there's a big, um, those uh, politically switched on drum and bass DJs who've been talking about politics on their feeds and stuff, and lots of the audience is coming and saying, stop politicising the music, this is nothing to do with race, you know, this is not a, it's not a black thing. And they're like... <clears throat> Do you know anything about the history of drum and bass? Do you know anything about who, where it comes from? Do you know anything about the influence of reggae on it? And that's, it's really important to keep making those arguments in order to, to, to build the grounds of a new form of solidarity. I feel very optimistic. As, going back to what you're saying about COVID, this is a moment of, a, it's dangerous, it's scary, it's terrifying, but systems are being broken and reformed. And we can Absolutely. intervene at this moment. Definitely opening up different possibilities. As fellow academics, and we hear people bandying about this, you know, roads must fall, decolonize the curriculum. It all sounds very nice and lovely and quaint, but what are your experiences of that? As well, a... you know, I've, I've been involved in like decolonizing working groups at SOAS and thinking about widening participation, all these buzzwords. And, you know, there's some really good work going on, but I've also listened to people, a lot of black students and black faculty, of which there are very few, talk about the university as a kind of anti-black space, as a space that's structurally excluding uh, the involvement of black students and black teachers. And um, I think that's true, but I want to hold on to the idea that university can be a space of liberation. But yeah. I, again, I return to the question. I mean, I know at least four really outstanding young black intellectuals. I call them intellectuals, they're writers, artists, performers, they might have done some university education, maybe an undergraduate degree, they are dying to get in, back into the university. But for a variety of reasons, and it's usually mainly financial, they can't. Yeah. There isn't the support structure for them right. to be in there. And this is the next generation of teachers. You know, SOAS is a very progressive place in many ways, but there's still a tiny fraction of black faculty comparative to white middle class teachers like me. Yeah. And um, there needs to be a really, a really concerted effort to open the doors for that new generation of people, because you can see it, it's in publishing, in music, in, in business, Absolutely. all of those, you've got a, a new generation of super smart, committed uh, intellectuals. And I do think it matters that those people are in the positions of power, like yourself, who are teaching, who are, it's not just a role model issue, it's actually bringing to bear your experience and the breadth of your knowledge, which is inherently diasporic. It's inherently drawing on Absolutely. tradition from Absolutely. outside of the Western canon. And that, I think it can be done. I hope to be part of it. But it, there are big, big challenges. And there is a, quite a lot of box ticking going on at the moment. We can see with everyone scrambling over themselves to declare themselves pro Black Lives Matter. You know, yeah. maybe they'll take yeah. the... It's yeah. great to take the statue down, right? The symbolic politics of the moment is, is potent, but it's symbolic. It's not structural. Yeah. It's not... I, I, even on that, I said, you know, that if we're going to remove these statues and it's not a teachable moment, then you might as well leave them up there. If you're not going to embed that in the national curriculum, so school children know that, yes, there was this guy, he was a philanthropist and blah, blah, blah. However, this is what he made. You know, I, I was, I did an interview the other day and I was shocked at this journalist's lack of knowledge of British history. Yeah. And we were on the phone. I was, I, like, he didn't know that Queen Elizabeth the first, all her teeth were rotten because of the consumption of sugar. And they used to call her the mumbling queen because she used to have to stuff her mouth with cloth and bits yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, he, and that really... he was like, really? And I was like, I'm, I'm saying to myself, that's how you introduce that into the national curriculum. So you'll say to the yeah. children, yeah, there was this wonderful queen, the white queen, Queen Elizabeth the first. You know, much of her wealth was accrued from blah, blah, blah. She commissioned the first privateers, John Hawkins and so Francis Drake. Francis Drake, yeah, exactly. It's not a big deal. But it is a big deal because they want that history to be hidden. 
Well, I think, you know, it reminds me of that brilliant Stuart Hall essay, you, you know, what is it called? The sugar you stir. The, you stir. It's like, you, like you say, you could yeah, start with yeah. the breakfast table, sugar, coffee, tea. You could yeah. tell the whole story. Of the co with colonialism, co imperialism, co and cha African chap enslavement. And it would make history Asian really, invention. really interesting. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it actually, I, I'm not threatened by that. I think that, I mean, it might be embarrassing for people like David Cameron to have to acknowledge that his family's wealth partly came yeah. from the enslavement of people. Well, yeah, you have to acknowledge it. You've got to stand up and, and face the music in a way. Not that he's personally responsible. It's not that, it's not that issue. No. And that's how, they, that's how they make that, that's how they, they make that argument. Um, that's, how they, that's how they devalue the argument. Yeah, they deflect because it. Because they'll say, saying, well, I wasn't there. I wasn't you know, here. I'm not whatever, but you are the recipient and a beneficiary of. Because I'm not saying, give up your wealth and privilege lifestyle. I'm just saying, when someone asks you a question, speak the truth like Boris Johnson. You well, know? exactly. How can he, if, he, if he was not the prime minister, he would not be in that job. With what he said about people who look like me and my history 18 years ago, he would have not been in that job. I mean, the level of incompetence that you can now get away with being a national leader is quite astonishing, isn't it? But, um, yeah. I think that as a, as a country, I think, I think there might be a change here. I do think that there is this, there's a moment where there's people who have woken up, white, white people I'm talking about, who, yeah. to the reality of racism, to the reality of the imperial structures which still surround us, and to the idea that actually we might want to try and shift that. And I'm hoping that this Boris Johnson stuff and the toffs returning and eating and all that is like the last gasp of the system, which fundamentally is not serving yeah. us very well. So that's what I, you know, let's, let's hope that this moment can be a, a time when we can sort of coalesce and uh, do the things that you and I, you know, when we, we, we're, we're sort of professionally involved in thinking about these issues and not everyone's read as much as we have or had the experience. Obviously, you've got the wealth of your experience, of your immediate experience of racism and that kind of issues as well that you can bring to bear in your teaching. But actually, I think there's a hunger now to understand more, to learn more, whether we can change the sort of st structures uh, remains to be seen. We have to keep up the energy. We've seen it come, you know, we've seen a lot. We've seen from Rodney King and then Michael Brown and Baltimore and, you know, going all the way back to the Martin Luther King situation. And here, like, Sean Rigg, right? And Sean Rigg, Mark Duggan, whatever yeah. examples you want. That's and right. That's why I, I, you know, that's why for, for me it's important that we always frame it and contextualise it in the context of the British Empire and in Britain. Because for me, that is the overall context. I, think I, so. wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, because we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you, what surprising thing can you reveal? And then a takeaway. Because I can't have Surprise. a on here and you don't give people something to take away and mull over. Okay. Um, I think that... The surprising thing, I don't know if it's that surprising, it surprised me. I was in an earthquake when I was in California in 1989. Well, like a proper earthquake. Proper. This one was proper. 6.9 on the Richter scale. Oh, wow. Which is a big one. It was called the Loma Prieta earthquake. It happened near San Francisco, but not in San Francisco, but it impacted. But the weird thing was, I mean, 70 people died and freeways collapsed and it was a big disaster. But weirdly, where I was, I was at the University of California, Santa Cruz, which is up on a big hill, a big rock. So where, where I actually was, I was walking down the road, um, it didn't appear to be a big tragedy. The road was like flopping like this. And oh, then really? I, was oh. I was near a swimming pool yeah. and the, the water polo team were in the swimming pool and the water was sloshing out of the swimming pool like this, just like making waves. And they were all whooping and cheering like it was a big fun and games, right? So to my initial experience of it, although it was really, it went on for about 40 seconds, it was really destabilizing. Yeah. wasn't that it was dangerous it was only later on that i went downtown and saw that things had collapsed and those yeah. people had died and yeah. the thing that it did to me was to you know how a lot of our metaphors like solid as a rock yeah. down to earth grounded yeah. safe as houses are all based yeah. on this idea that things are fixed and permanent and solid yeah. no none of it is it's yeah. none of it it's all subject to forces that you have got no control over so don't sort of rely on anything to you know to stay solid that was my sort of takeaway message from well that. Karl Marx isn't it all that solid melts into melts air melts into air exactly Absolutely. Yeah. exactly and, and I what guess about my a take takeaway my takeaway would be I'm finding the, the the depth 
of emotion, the depth of understanding and engagement and beauty that I can access through music. And here I, I write and think and talk and love black music primarily. Um, contemporary jazz in particular, the kind of jazz that's bubbling up from, the, from Chicago, but also in London, which is combining, uh, you know, dance music, drill, jazz, Afrobeat, with a strong political edge. People like Jamie Branch, Ezra Collective, uh, Moses Boyd, uh, Emma Jane Thackeray. There's just an incredible riches out there for people to both sort of balm your soul at a time when you need it and to drive your thinking forward. So I would urge people, if they want to know more about this moment, if they want to look for resources for thinking about how to get beyond it, it's in the music now more than ever. Casper, all I can say is give thanks and um, I know we'll catch up soon. Listen, yeah. it's been great. Well, I, I truly give thanks that you joined me today on the Out of You, where, as you can evidently see, reason comes first. Stay blessed. Reason. Stay focused. Always. Nice, Ned. Cheers.